um, and we are going to be recording the session so that we can share it with people who can't attend. Um, so that's already said that. Um, and so uh, that's all now recording. So we'll kick off properly. Um, thanks very much for joining us for this session on the procurement bill. Um, it's been organised by Lloyds Bank Foundation, Social Enterprise UK, NCBO, Locality and Charities Aid Foundation. Um, and before we get into um, the kind of the main part of this, um, agenda part of this session. We're just going to share a quick poll just to give us an idea about the experiences within the room. So Callum, if you're able to share the poll, please. So we're just asking um, if have, whether you have faced challenges when it comes to commissioning and procurement processes. Um, simple yes or no answer. Hopefully quite easy. How are we doing on responses, Callum? Yep, yeah, I think that's about everyone now. Brilliant. Can you share the results, please? You can see them. Can you shout them out just because they're not appearing on my screen? Yes, they've come up. So yeah. about 93% of the room have said yes, 4% no, and 4% not sure. Brilliant. Thanks very much for bearing with us on that one. Um, really helpful to get a sense of where everyone is at. Um, clearly a lot of you have faced challenges and it's these types of challenges that we're really hopeful that some of the new procurement rules could go some way to help to address. Um, so just worth bearing that in mind as we go through the session. Um, so a little bit about why we're here, why we want to talk about the procurement bill with you. Um, we've been working together, so the organisations that I mentioned and others, to try and influence the new procurement rules um, because we know it matters to charities. Um, for years, we've heard from charities about the challenges you face when it comes to commissioning. Um, often this is a result of processes which can make it difficult for charities to access funding to deliver public services. Um, now, the new procurement bill um, is going to set the framework for how procurement works for all goods and services outside of the NHS. So we're really keen to make sure that that framework addresses some of the challenges that you've obviously been facing. Um, it is worth saying that this session and the procurement rules are focused on the process, they're on how services and goods are procured. It won't impact the total amount of funding that is available for services, um, which we know is a massive problem. And we're working with us, others to try and address that too. But this session and the procurement bill is very much focused on the forthcoming rules for procurement, um, where they're at and how you can help to influence them. So we are going to be sharing the slides in this session afterwards as well. So don't worry about writing it all down um, if you just want to listen and take it in. So during the session, we'll be hearing from Andrew from, S from Social Enterprise UK, who's going to provide an overview of the procurement bill, what it is and what's happened to it so far. We'll also be hearing from Chikondi from Angelou Centre in the northeast of England, who will talk about it from a charity perspective and um, why she's keen to influence um, the bill and speak to her MP about it. Um, we'll be hearing from Sam from NCVO, who's going to outline where we think the bill could be strengthened. And then finally, we're going to talk about how you might be able to help make this happen. So how you can try and help make it better. Um, so I will, without further ado, pass over to Andrew to talk about the bill so far. Thanks very much. And um, my name is Andrew O'Brien. I'm Director for External Affairs at Social Enterprise UK. Um, the procurement bill hasn't just emerged out of nowhere. It's been part of an ongoing piece of work that's been taking place since Brexit. And the UK is trying to create its own national framework for procurement. Um, it started off with a green paper a few years ago. Um, and um, that was under a very different government <laughs> with different, different priorities. Um, and uh, to be honest, the bill doesn't bear a huge amount of relationship with the Green Paper that emerged, and it was much stronger on issues around social value, around transparency, and around accountability. 
and those have been somewhat watered down, uh, particularly um, under George Jacob Rees Mogg's tenure when he was the Minister of Responsible to the Bill. So, um, in a sense, what we've got in this uh, procurement bill is quite a bare bones piece of legislation that really just creates a, a very um, flexible, you might say, uh, framework, but at the same time, probably doesn't have a huge amount of accountability or teeth to it. Uh, effectively, it's going to allow public bodies, central government, local government, uh, within certain objectives, which we'll come to, uh, a lot of flexibility to decide how they're going to go about running and operating procurement processes and awarding contracts. Um, so anyway, the bill was published last year. Um, it started in the House of Lords, which again is an unusual way of doing things. This, this bill has had quite an unusual passage. There's been a huge number of amendments to it. Um, there has been a, a quite, given the size of the bill and the complexity and usual conventions in Parliament, not as much time as you'd expect to be debated and discussed either. And that's been a big complaint by some members of the House of Lords as well. Uh, but it was introduced last year. Uh, MPs now debating the bill, so we had second reading on Monday, which is just a, a basic debate where they talk about the, the themes and the principles of legislation. I didn't get into any detail. The committee stage is due to be announced soon, but we're probably looking at something in the next three or four weeks. Uh, and then we're looking for this bill, if it you know, goes through a, in a normal process, will probably be completed by March, um, looking at April for, for uh, getting all the sense, and then guidance will be drafted over the summer and probably implemented uh, towards the end of this calendar year, early next year. Um, so um, there's a lot taking place over the next year. This will be quite an important year for procurement, uh, and the guidance and the legislation will shape uh, the kind of culture of procurement in the UK for at least the next probably five, six, seven years uh, until they decide to update it. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, how have we tried to shape it? Um, obviously, you know, us, Boys Bank, NCBO, Charity Safe Foundation, we've all put submissions in. We've spent a lot of hours with officials uh, trying to help them to see where some of the challenges are, the value of our sectors, um, you know, what are the particular issues. Uh, I've met with ministers. I know NCBO met with Baroness Neville Rolfe uh, recently, for example. Uh, you know, we met with Lord Agnew, if you can believe it, back in 2022 when it was first being drafted, the Green Paper was put together. Uh, and we're trying to secure further meetings with them. We've met with Cabinet Office, DCNS, uh, you know, a range of different officials. Um, and obviously, this impacts the whole of the public sector. There's a lot of stakeholders to be engaged with. Um, and in the House of Lords, where I think we've, you know, been relatively successful in getting lots of references to the voluntary sector, social enterprise, social value. And as we come on to some of the amendments that have been passed, you know, we've got a few wins in the bank which we need to defend when it comes to this House of Commons stage as well. I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. But essentially, it's been a huge you know, piece of work around engagement. Um, what are the key, kind of key parts of the bill? Well, at basic level, it's just trying to create, as I say, a kind of UK national framework for procurement. Procurement policy and regulation tends to be based on EU rules. Now it's going to be based on UK rules solely. Obviously, there is some crossover with the EU due to our treaty with them. Um, but essentially, it's about you know, how, what are the principles you use when you go about procuring something? What are the processes? Uh, what are the sort of levels of accountability and transparency and disclosure that need to take place? A lot of the bill covers utility and defense and um, kind of other sensitive areas of procurement um, because, you know, they have their own special needs. So actually the, the stuff that directly references the kind of contracts that charities will be bidding for is a relatively small part of this legislation. But, you know, again, the principles and the framework is quite important. Um, there are some good elements to the bill. Um, the fact that you can, you know, there is an encouragement to uh, consider breaking up contracts into smaller lots is good. Um, again, the pipeline notices you can read in the bullet point there. There's also, they're keeping the reservation of contracts for mutuals or employee owned staff owned businesses as spin outs from the public sector, many of them register as charities or cooperatives or social enterprises. So, you know, there are some positive elements to it there. Um, but, there are quite a number of gaps as well, and I guess we'll come on to those in a moment. If we go on to the next slide. Um, so yes, this is probably you know one of the areas where this kind of gives you a flavor, I suppose, of some of the, the trickiness of engaging with government when it comes to policy of this kind. Uh, on the one hand, we do have something quite positive here that like contract type, type contracts are included in this legislation, which wasn't necessarily a given. And effectively, like touch contracts are contracts where um, the public sector can choose to have a limited procurement process. So rather than going through a full process uh, and 
you know, disclosures and kind of due diligence and accountability and, you know, having to go through a competitive tendering stage, you can reduce some of the burden of that. Ultimately, it's still be a competitive tendering process, but there could be more flexibility in the kind of approaches and principles that you put into that uh, and who you consult with. Um, but they don't give a huge amount of detail as to what that light touch process will be. They don't say what it should be used for. So there's a danger that no one will use light touch contracts process because they don't have to. It's purely optional. Um, and we've been doing some work with Wood Bank and interview and others to sort of really encourage peers and MPs to think about people centered services and uh, you know, community centered services and the fact that that's what the light touch regime should be used for. You know, obviously, you're buying paper paper clips, computers, you should go through a proper competitive tendering process. But if you're buying something quite specialized, quite localized, uh, something very sensitive in terms of its engagement with community and service users, you might want to use a, a light touch process to do so. So it's in the bill, but it's sort of not in the bill in the sense of it's not got a lot of clarity as to exactly what its status is or how it should be used. Um, but um, again, that's something which we will continue to keep pushing on, and it might be worth getting you know, some feedback from people on this in the chat around you know, your experience of the light touch process. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, again, some positive changes here, particularly, I guess, the one I would point out of these two bullet points is around moving away from most economically advantageous tender to most advantageous tender. Now, some of this is probably dancing on the head of a pin. Um, you know, what does economically mean? I mean, it can be very broad um, economically. I mean, it effectively means everything that's uh, affecting people's quality of life and standard of living. Uh, but I think the view was certainly, you know, from an official perspective, a lot of officials felt that the, the economic element of it really meant financial um, and therefore there was a focus on lowest cost. The fact they've gone from that to most advantageous tender does in theory provide additional flexibility because you've, we've dropped the economic element of that means we can consider social, environmental factors, policy factors. Um, I think government's particularly keen around leveling up, for example, on how that can be achieved through smarter procurement and rebalancing the way the public money is spent. So that's a quite a big move and we'll have to wait to see how the courts interpret most advantageous tender, and they'll be sure there'll be legal cases over the next few years where people will test that. Um, but the theories will give more flexibility. So again, if you're in conversations with procurement and commissioning team, and they tell you they just have to work on the basis of price and economic performance, you could actually start to use some of this language and go, well, no, that's not your responsibility. You, know, you have to think about the most advantageous considering a wide range of rules. Um, and in terms of contract preliminary, preliminary, preliminary market engagement, I mean, again, that's important, but um, it, it's, it's always been there. You've always had that ability to, to do so, just giving a bit more uh, legal cover for commissioning and procurement teams to actually go out to the market and talk to people. And again, I think for smaller charities, that's been you know, a particular problem over the years. So hopefully there's some opportunity to change that. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so yes, I mean, this is one of the wins that we have achieved. I mean, there's two bits to this. I mean, one is mentioned on this slide here around um, this thing called the National Procurement Policy Statement. So this is a very long, boring piece of guidance, but essentially lays out how the government is interpreting its own rules uh, and its own objectives. Um, and um, it lays out things like, you know, they want to help SMEs, they want to help level up the country, they want to achieve net zero. They also, in the current iteration of it, want to promote social value. Um, but there's no legal requirement for them to do that. They could have not put social value into the National Procurement Policy Guidance and just, you know, effectively denuded that from, from the procurement system. Um, what we've managed to do with this bill uh, and a, an amendment from Lord Lansley, of all people, um, if anyone who knows Health and Care Act and some of the changes made to CCGs, he's got turned into a, a very strong ally of ours on social value, and um, that's great to see. Um, and he uh, put forward an amendment which would require the government to always, in their national procurement policy statement, include how they're going to deliver the Public Services Social Value Act uh, in that process. So uh, effectively, um, you know, what, what we've, he's done through this amendment is require, require the government to always outline how it's going to deliver social value through its statutory guidance, which, you know, we had a long period when the Social Value Act, those of you know, this is a piece of legislation that requires the public sector to think about economic, uh, social, economic and environmental well-being when uh, commissioning and procuring goods. Um, for about 10 years, we had no guidance on it whatsoever. So this is quite important, actually. It will require them to say something, um, even if we don't like what they say, at least have to be some kind of framework for that. 
Labour also managed to get an amendment through, which I'm not sure whether it will stay in. I mean, obviously, governments don't tend to like opposition amendments, so they're probably going to be doing their level best to take it out of the bill. But um, they did produce a amendment which would have expanded the definition of the objectives of the procurement system. So these are things, you know, the government, for example, had put in things like value for money uh, and public benefit, ensuring that it creates positive outcomes for the public um, as um, one of its um, kind of principles. Um, but um, Labour have managed to produce an amendment which has gone slightly further than that. Uh, so it covers things like having regard to SMEs, uh, thinking about transparency and fraud, uh, thinking about, um, you know, how we can create additional social, economic, and environmental positive impact. So um, that's quite a useful hook as well. I mean, it doesn't say social value, but effectively it's the same thing. Um, so if it was to remain in there, that would give us quite a strong framework. And again, it would give charities the ability to push back on some of those who just have a very kind of one dimensional view of what procurement should look like. Um, so that's um, something that we should hopefully try and defend. And we're working very closely with Labour and backbench Tory MPs and others to see what we can do to try and kind of stiffen their resolve to make sure that that remains in the bill. Um, go on to the next slide. I think that's it, everything from me. Um, I mean, it's a very, very complicated piece of legislation. I mean, if you've got any questions, any specifics, um, do just feel free to drop me an email or you can contact with myself or Sam or Caroline or others. I'm sure we can find you an answer to something. Um, but, you know, this is not going to be a process. A bill isn't saying it just finishes on the day it's passed. This is it will rumble on for years and years and years. There'll be guidance, training, all sorts of things, new guidance that will overwrite the previous guidance. So just think we need charities and social enterprises always need to keep our eye on um, and you know, work in partnership together to try and get the best outcome. So I hope that's given a bit of a flavor of it. I appreciate some of that requires a little bit of expert knowledge in terms of the procurement regime looked like previously um, and, and uh, so on, but hopefully that's given you a bit of a, a flavor of where we currently are and state of play. If that's all right, Caroline. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so yeah, I hope that's a bit of a, some background information about some of the key areas that we think might be relevant um, for charities and social enterprises. Um, I'm now delighted that Chikondi, for, who is Executive Director at the Angelou Centre in the Northeast, is able to join us. Um, if you'd like to come off mute, Chikondi, um, to talk through um, this from the, from, from the perspective of Angelou Centre in terms of um, why this matters to them and why they want to get involved. So over to you, Chikondi. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Um, I just um, will be talking about the impacts that it will have on our um, small charities. And uh, my uh, aim is to encourage all of us to be able to engage with our local MPs at the end of what I'm going to be saying. So the Angelus Center is a specialist black-led feminist not-for-profit organization. It aims to advance rights, uh, human rights, and equality for um, the uh, disadvantaged communities. But mostly, we're looking at uh, empowerment of women and their in independence, and uh, providing advocacy, information, and advice and guidance for. Uh, as well as training and social um, uh, recreation activities for everyone that we work with. So uh, we are based in the Northeast in Newcastle and we have a, a catchment area of um, uh, the whole the nation because we get referrals from London, from, from Scotland, from uh, Wales in, in, in other places but we are basically based here in the Northeast. Next slide. Um, so our approach is uh, a holistic for black and minoritized women and children in the Northeast. Uh, and we, uh, we also uh, work on emergency and move on accommodation for women and families fleeing abuse, including domestic violence and access to advocacy services specific for black and minoritized women and children. We, uh, we uh, provide therapeutic support for counseling, arts and crafts for women and children within this community and, and the, uh, the uh, surrounding catchment area. We also provide accredited um, and non-accredited training for the 
women and, and the children that we uh, uh, work with. We prioritize those that have not, no recourse to public funds. And as a well-being and inclusion services, activities and events are available to all. But uh, as a uh, therapeutic training, I know that are uh, mostly uh, for those that are not accessing the uh, public funds. We also work, make sure that there is a voice and choice uh, uh, as one of our principles for the women that we work with because they mostly are lacking this kind of for uh, a voice and, and choice in what uh, they are doing. Next slide. Now, um, our experience of commissioning as a small charity, I think uh, what Andrew has uh, uh, brought out uh, uh, in terms of the procurement bill is uh, uh, very clear that we do have issues around this, uh, these documents being thick, big and uh, are very, very uh, uh, um, tedious for us to go through as a small charity. We do not have a, an expert department where they would be uh, having to go through the bidding process and all that. So uh, applying through thick documents that have guidelines, they have this and, and, and all that, is, it becomes a bit of a laborious and in the end, it makes us uh, uh, get external expertise. And, and that is uh, uh, a, an issue for us because we have to be paying for to buy those that kind of expertise. And the, also we, we always are struggling between uh, uh, the best value test, there is a best value test and social value, the services that we provide for the black and minoritized women um, are, are bordered between, yes, the uh, social values, they have a social value because they, of the communities we are working with and everything, but then they, they would be uh, 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 bringing us to competition to say, is this the best value and all that. So these uh, 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 procurement uh, processes always give us that struggle we are uh, fighting in between those tests. We, we, we bid for people or services from the local authority here. Uh, and we're looking at the housing, for example, for our uh, refugee um, uh, heavens for the women. So we are specialized, uh, we are specialized for black and minoritized women. And this is, uh, uh, the procurement bill is gonna be uh, um, giving us the uh, tough choices when we are dealing with our local council here, because this procurement bill is not only for the national or big, uh, uh, it is also for the councils. And we know that as, as they are putting these uh, thing, uh, uh, processes in, pla in place, we are already facing uh, uh, laborious processes. And then this procurement bill is not making uh, things uh, any easier for us. And, and our issues around a quality impact assessments, um, they, they've talked about uh, um, the proportionality and all the other things in the bill, but the, uh, these are not always addressed and are not always into, taken into consideration when we are, are, are procuring the services. And we keep having to negotiate and, and advocate for such. In, uh, uh, this becomes for us a, a full-time, every time um, activity that we have to be keeping uh, negotiating around that. So we intend to retain independent voice for the black minority, uh, minorities and the ethnic women and the, uh, the women's sector. But then we would be uh, uh, put at, uh, uh, at risk if the, with the, there is no clear um, a path or clear language that would give the, um, the con commissioning uh, bodies, the commissioning people, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, issues that we, are, uh, uh, we work for and the women we work for, if they are not put in the picture clearly in the, in the procurement bill. Now, the, also for us, that is the uh, uh, part of making uh, partnerships 
uh, with uh, as we are doing part of this commissioning, it is also a way of making partnerships with the uh, different uh, um, um, uh, commissioning bodies. But in, in, if the bill is not, it's just a strictly uh, there is no clear way that we'll be able to be forging those partnerships. And uh, uh, in our case, next slide. Now the uh, 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 elements of the uh, commissioning process that make it hard for us. The guidelines give room for the contractors to set timelines, but not give specifics. So they can they can advertise if it is to this certain. So it's not encouraging them to actually give that advance notice. The advance notice for us is uh, helps us to be able to outsource the bidding uh, experts and it gives us time to organize ourselves whether in consortiums to be able to reach out to 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 reach out and get this bid but if we do not have that clearly put in there it is a, a very difficult for small charities to organize and and uh, and get the the fund and if we do not know the existence of a, a, a fund uh, normally we even go for small funds if they are not going to be advertised for example then we would not be able to know the of their uh, to have knowledge of their existence and it will be uh, uh, sidelining a lot of our small charities that would not know that these bids are going on. As a small charity, we don't have resources to invest in bid making department, as I have just said, but, but consultation with the other stakeholders in it makes it uh, uh, easy for us. Now, there is a, a, a risk of putting us in to be competing with the others in this uh, same bid. And that competition is the, uh, mostly uh, favorable for the uh, larger organization, larger charities, uh, more than us, the smaller charities. When they are competing uh, 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 on the bid, they should be able to give a, a room of, uh, uh, for flexibility that the smaller charities would be able to compete. But in, in other instances, what we have seen is that we get into a consortium, we get into an agreement with the um, a, a larger charity, and the larger charity can or may not tell us that they have received the bid, they have been successful. And in the end, we will not know. But the, the bidding is the, uh, are not clearly uh, um, uh, giving the commissioners the uh, responsibility or accountability to check back to see that the, the bidding process and those that were in the bid have actually accessed the, the bid. So it, the language must be clearer to that extent that the people that are, are, are joining up bids, they are actually getting the bids and understanding. In some instances, we also have seen that the wording is not that tight to guard. It is giving room for people to be deciding and uh, it should be encouraging them to actually look out for smaller charities and smaller organizations. And I, I think, next slide. So we, we think that it is important for those reasons that we have uh, uh, narrated and, and the experiences that we have had, that we should be engaging with this uh, uh, bill and engaging with our own um, 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 local MPs. Now we would be, as Angelo Center, we will be uh, or, or engaging our women voices groups and get them to pin their MP. They will be writing letters to their MP so that they will be able to uh, 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 engage with this bill in Parliament as they are debating. So this is what we are actually getting our uh, service users here to do, they should pay their MPs and the MPs should be engaging with this bill anywhere, wherever they are, because uh, uh, this is a, an issue that will impact the, the services that we provide to them. We will also be maximizing our influence of, via social media. We'll be uh, putting um, uh, 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 notices for or the MPs to engage with this procurement bill and we are alerting that the bill is being discussed and we would like to have them engage 
as as part of our our, um, our supporters and uh, uh, the way that we are doing. And we will be also looking at uh, campaigning with our networks. So we belong to the Phoenix Way Partnership. We belong to the Voluntary Se Sector Networking. So for, for, we will be asking all our, our partners that we work with to also be uh, paying their MPs, discussing with their MPs so that they can engage and, and bring these issues uh, to the fore. Um, uh, uh, finally, we will be using uh, uh, every chance with our seminars, with our partners and all that, bring this uh, 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 to form. Uh, next slide, I think. Um, so I would like to ask a question. Will you join us in engaging with your MP? Because I think this is very important for us. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chikondi. Um, that was really helpful. And I think a lot of things that will resonate with a lot of others on the call, potentially around the challenges that you faced when it comes to commissioning. Um, I'm now going to hand over to, um, to Sam from NCVO, who's going to talk through how um, we think the bill could be strengthened to overcome some of those challenges. Thanks so much, Caroline. And yeah, thank you, Chikondi, for sharing the Angelou Center's experiences, because I think um, we, as we've been working on this bill over the last year, we have constantly been thinking about, well, how can we bring this to life? Um, how can we kind of make it clear that this isn't just about kind of processes and, and people sitting in offices purchasing IT software. Um, this is about, you know, real people's lives and the services that they have access to and kind of the um, ways in which they are empowered or not um, to move forward in their lives. Um, and so we have been focusing on uh, areas of the bill that we think could be strengthened to improve um, the some of the challenges that Chikandi was describing, some of the challenges Andrew talked about. Um, and I think we, I think there are larger questions here kind of beyond the scope of, of this bill and this work about um, kind of the whole commissioning cycle um, and, you know, bigger questions about how we, how we purchase these kinds of services, how we develop them, how we evaluate them, how we make sure they're kind of achieving long-term change for people. But what we've tried to do here is hang, um, kind of find things in the bill or things that are specifically kind of concretely lacking from the bill that we can say, well, you should change this or you should add this. Um, so I guess I just want to note that like we recognize some of the limitations here, um, but we are working within kind of a, a framework that has been set by the government. Um, so we've got a lot of different areas that we pulled out as needing improvement um, in the bill. And the very first of those is, as Andrew said, um, this issue with light touch contracts. And um, in under previous or kind of current regulations, because um, the bill is obviously not law yet, um, light touch contracts can be used for, for services for people. Um, and in the bill, that is kind of thrown wide open to anything that a contracting authority deems um, appropriate for light touch contract. And as Andrew said, the worry is either that just won't get used at all, or it will get used for things that it's not right for. Um, and one of the ways that we've been trying to emphasize to government that they really need to make clear, like, the ways in which this can and should be used is by... Um, focusing on proportionality and proportionate processes and not kind of buying missiles um, in the same way that you buy kind of local domestic abuse services. Um, they have pushed back on that quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of things that we've encountered in this engagement work where it just doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense, frankly. Um, and so proportionality is certainly included throughout the bill. It's kind of, it's mentioned in specific clauses and in relation to specific um, types of processes, but it's not an overarching objective of the bill and we really think that it should be. Um, Andrew talked about, uh, we're pushing for a much greater focus on social value um, and how, you know, the way that charities do things um, is inherently a contribution to an area's social value. It's not kind of an an add-on. It's not tacked on to to what they're doing. It's it's kind of part of the fabric of what you all are doing. Um, 
And tied with that, we really want to see uh, value for money defined in the bill. Um, that is a term that gets used quite a quite a few times in the text of the legislation, but it's kind of there's no there's no attempt to explain what the government thinks that should mean. Um, it's kind of taken as a given that we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about value for money. But I think Chikandi illustrated that with that kind of battle between social value and quote unquote best value, because best value is often taken to mean cost, unit price. Um, and if you can present the lowest unit price, like that's value for money. Um, and so we're really pushing for a wider um, and a much more holistic understanding of, of value for money. Um, and we're encouraging better communication and transparency because one of the first points Chikandi made was around not having that in-house expertise or even if you do kind of develop that expertise because you've done this again and again, like you have a full-time job and, you know, you're the CEO or you're the COO and you're writing this bit on the weekend um, and it's just really not sustainable to um for small organizations to participate or to kind of expend their energy in that way. And so we really want to see a strengthening of this whole regime of kind of different types of notices and different ways of ensuring um, that there are fewer barriers for, for charities and social enterprises. Um, next slide, please. Um, the one area in which we could kind of try and influence a bit more of the whole commissioning cycle and not just the, the kind of procuring the service bit is around preliminary market engagement. So there is um, a bit in the bill that says contracting authorities can engage with, with suppliers and with service users. I think it says with suppliers and others um, as a, a kind of early step in deciding um, in the procurement process. But then it says that um, the the contracting authority should take care not to confer undue um, advantage and it says if if there is any undue advantage conferred, then suppliers cannot participate in the tender. Um, and so we have said to government that that's going to have a chilling effect. That's going to mean that the same kind of risk aversion that exists now um, will continue there. You know, even if a contracting authority is willing to to go through a preliminary market engagement exercise, suppliers may not want to participate in that because they don't want to run the risk of being excluded once those tender documents eventually come out. Um, we have also been working with um, some other organizations, particularly Inclusion London and Inclusion Barnet, on strengthening the definition of supported employment providers. So in the bill, um, there's a provision for uh, contracting authorities to reserve contracts for employers where, for suppliers, where they employ at least 30% of staff who are disabled or disadvantaged. And in the original kind of 2006 procurement um, regulations that were obviously um, part of our participation in the EU, um, that threshold was 50% and it was disabled staff. The word disadvantaged was not included. And the thing is, disadvantaged does not have a legal definition. Um, you can you can search all day and it really is a disputed, highly disputed term. Um, and there's, there's no basis for it in the law. Whereas disabled, obviously, the Equalities Act 2010 has a very clear definition of what disabled means. Um, and 30% is a low, it's a low threshold. Um, whereas the original regulation said 50%, and we're pushing for that to be brought back up to 50%. Um, these last couple points about, so uh, you may have heard of this issue of, of big candy, um, where um, kind of providers are included as subcontractors on a bid to strengthen that bid. So to say, you know, for the for the prime to say, look, we have this local connection or we're going to pro provide this number of specialist, you know, places for this service. But then um, that smaller provider never sees the referrals or, you know, um, doesn't even know that they've been included in that bid. Um, and at the moment, there's really nothing in the con in the procurement bill to to head that off. Um, there are some bits around kind of strengthening 
um, contracting authorities can require con um, providers and then subcontractors to enter into a legal arrangement. Um, but it's unclear kind of what the accountability there would look like. Um, we are, so there's a bit in the bill around direct award, um, direct awards where other legislation requires that the person receiving the service um, has a say in what service they get. And it's really not very clear whether that's intended to be used on a person by person basis, which is not very strategic um, and doesn't really lend itself, you know, it's it's all well and good for somebody to say, you know, this is the service that I want, but if that service can't exist because they have no kind of sustainable basis for funding, um, that's really not going to work very well. So we've sought clarification um, from officials uh, and we, I think we're going to be pushing for that a bit more in the House of Commons on whether that could actually be used um, for a group of people, for, for a community of people accessing services. Um, where you could actually just directly award um, based on their that community's kind of preference for the service that they receive. Um, so that's very unclear at the moment. And finally, there's a bit about um, being able to debar providers where I think the term is beneficial owner, um, where the beneficial owner has um, previously had a conviction. And there's nothing in there to say, you know, except where that conviction is spent. Um, and so we've gone back to them and said, well, actually, you know, you should be the ones upholding, um, you know, rehabilitation legislation. And and there should be absolutely no reason to debar a provider um, where the person's conviction um, is, is spent. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so we have been doing quite a lot around this. Um, we were sending lots of briefings to peers um, in the House of Lords last year, last summer. Um, we're now doing that with MPs. Um, so we sent a briefing um, to uh, quite a lot of MPs who we have relationships with or who, you know, are are very interested in the voluntary sector um, ahead of the second reading on Monday. And we're going to be doing that um, ahead of committee stage, um, helping them to think about, you know, potential amendments that they could table um, and as Andrew mentioned, we're still speaking to officials, um, you know, talking to to the people who are going to be drafting secondary legislation, drafting the statutory guidance um, and putting in place all of the training that procurement and commissioning um, people are going to be getting ahead of the implementation of this bill. Um, so, yeah, we've covered some of this. Um, yeah, we've really covered all of this, actually. So we're expecting committee stage to start in the next few weeks. It's always a little hard to say, um, but we're gonna be engaging with MPs ahead of that um, to make sure they're they're thinking about these issues. Next slide, please. Um, so is this where I pass back to you, Caroline? It is, thanks very Perfect. much. Um, um, so hopefully you've got a sense now of, of what's in the bill and also how it could be made better. Um, and we wanted to spend the last part of this session speaking to you about how you could help to make it better. Um, so we're really keen for charities to get in touch with your MPs about the bill um, because you're really well placed to demonstrate why it's so important. Um, we know that procure when you hear the word procurement, it can sound quite dull, it can sound quite technical, um, but it impacts on what service services are available to all of us locally um, and you're really well placed to, to kind of make that case and demonstrate why it's so important. So the first stage in thinking about how you can get involved and how you can help um, is actually thinking through effectively the case for support. So how can you try and humanise this issue and make procurement um, feel relatable and important and impacting on, on local people? Um, so when you're before you're kind of getting in contact with your MP, you might want to think about what you want to tell them. So what can you tell them about your service, who you're supporting? How does the work that you're doing um, help to help individual people? How does it help the community? How might it help the local economy? Um, but then also a little bit like um, Chikandi was doing earlier, 
talking about the challenges that you face when it comes to commissioning and, pro and procurement, what are the process challenges that make it really hard for you to be able to access the funding that you need from statutory um, providers, so from statutory agencies, in order to deliver those public services? And then the, as the kind of the, almost the most important part is actually what's the impact of that? When it goes wrong, when those processes mean that you um, really struggle to be able to access that funding to deliver those services, what does it mean for the types of services that are delivered locally? What does it mean for the people that you're working with? And what does it mean, for example, for your local economy? So when you, you've kind of thought about that, they obviously need to get in contact with your um, MP. There are many ways that you can do this. You could write them a letter, you could write them an email, um, you could attend one of their constituency surgeries, um, you could invite them to visit your charity so they can see the difference that you make in the community. Um, and when you're contacting them, you, you really want to try and think about how can you make them care about this issue? There are so many things that people will be contacting their MPs about on a day to day basis. How can you demonstrate that this is really important, that this is really going to make a difference to people in their constituencies and ultimately the people that they want to vote for them? So actually, how can you make it feel like this is going to make a real difference to local people? And then you want to talk to them as well about what you want them to do. So that might be about putting forward amendments about where you think the bill could be strengthened. It could be ha encouraging them to contribute to debates, making sure that they vote on things in a way that is actually helpful. Um, and, and don't worry if you kind of don't feel confident about the specifics about well, what wording should I suggest. If you are contacting your MPs and they want to um, that they want to pick this up, then you can always get in touch with us or NCVO and we're more than happy to speak to those MPs and provide um, wording and kind of directions about what they might be able to do. I think, but the most important first step is trying to get that buy-in. How can we get that appetite from MPs that they really want to contribute to this and it's a, an issue that they really care about and think is important? Um, and to help with that, we are going to be sending around um, a um, a briefing after this session, um, along with the slides, and it includes um, some background information, like an overview of the bill, similar to what we've gone through today. It also includes a sample briefing that you can share directly with your MP if you want to, that has more information about what the issues are with the bill, what, it, what are the challenges with that, and how could it be um, made better. And there's also a template letter that you can use for contacting your MP if you want to use that as well. Um, but I think the key thing in doing this is personalising it. So there's lots of work that we and the others on this call have done to try and contact MPs, to work with um, MPs, to try and, and, and officials to make this um, stronger. But actually, you've got much more chance of getting through because you can make those local connections. Um, so the more that you can draw on those local connections and show the difference it makes to your local community, um, the better. Similarly, the information that we send out will contain information about lots of ways that the procurement bill could be improved. You don't need to include all of them. You can just share the areas that you think are most important or the areas that relate most to your experience. Um, and we're going to talk through an example to, to try and bring that to life um, a little bit. So I've just created um, a made up example just to think through how you can translate um, a charity's experience to what you might want to talk your, to your MP about. So in this case, um, it's a small charity that has provided holistic support to people facing homelessness locally for 15 years. They recently lost their contract for homelessness support to a national organisation that has no track record of homelessness support in the area. The excessively complicated tender process was only open for four weeks and the service manager worked evenings and weekends to meet the deadline on top of their normal work. The charity could demonstrate a track record of delivering high quality services that engage local volunteers and work closely with a, a range of other local services to bring those accessing support together with other community groups. The team delivering the service includes people with experience of homelessness, and the main reason for the charity losing the contract was the higher unit cost of the service. So in this case, the impact of the charity losing that service, um, primarily because of the way that the commissioning and procurement process was run, 
was that clients didn't want to access support from the new provider. It wasn't known locally. It wasn't trusted. For those people that did still access support, um, they were no longer connected into the, the local community groups like they were in the previous service. And it led to um, people that were accessing the service being increasingly isolated. And you lost that whole community cohesion um, kind of element that was part of the, the previous um, deliverer. And because it was a national organization, there was also reduced use of local supply chains. So the money that was invested in the service, not all of it was being reinvested in the local area. For example, because the, the national organization had supply chains that they, they used nationally, they had management that was kind of outside of the area. So there were a range of kind of impacts both on individuals, but also on the community and the local economy. So in this example, the charity might want to um, explain their situation to the um, to the MP and also pick out bits of the procurement bill that really relate to their experience. So, for example, they might want to ask the, the MP to really call for increased focus on social value um, and, and as part of that as well, improving understanding of value for money and most advantageous tender. Because as Sam mentioned, the danger with those not being really defined in the legislation is that it will fall back onto these considerations of what is the lowest unit cost. So we, re we really want to, the government to be giving more direction to say, actually, you should be including these wider considerations when you're deciding who is going to get the money. Because it's a small organisation that also faced challenges with the kind of just the standard processes of it being overly complex and not being enough time, they might also want to talk to their MP about what steps could actually make it easier for small charities to be able to compete for the funding. Um, so that could be um, minimum time periods um, that, that tenders are out for. It could be doing more preliminary market engagement. So providing that kind of information and support before the tender goes out so that charities can be, be ready for it. And, and you might notice that lots of these things feel like they might be in the bill or there are references into the bill as they stand already. But I think the, the kind of overarching concern is that the bill allows for lots of things to happen, but it doesn't encourage those things to happen. And we know from experience of the, the existing rules that where flexibilities exist, they're not used unless they're encouraged, unless government is explicit about these are the different ways that you can operate and these are the different things that you can do. Um, so as I mentioned, we will, after this session, send round um, the slides and also the briefing, which includes um, links to find out who your MP is, um, ideas about how to contact your MP, a template letter that you can use if you would like to, um, and the briefing that you're welcome to share with um, with your MPs. It also includes contact details for us and NCBO. So if your MP does want to find out more, does want to find out what they can do, um, you are welcome to talk to them yourselves, obviously, but you're also welcome to put them in contact with us. Um, and as the bill progresses, we'll also have more detail about where we know there are particular amendments that are being put down or where we know there are particular votes that we really would like their support on. Um, and we can go back to them with more information about that. Um, so we are almost at the end of um, the session, um, conscious that we don't have very much time left, but I did want to um, ask for, for one, one favour. Um, I hope that you found the session helpful today. We would like you just to spend um, a couple of minutes, if you can, just um, completing a short um, a, a short survey to find out, oh, there we go. So Callum has shared it, thank you very much. Um, to find out how you found the session today, um, partly so we can understand um, what you might do on the back of it. I'm really keen to know if you are planning to contact your MPs and who they are, um, so that we might be able to, to follow up and provide more information as well but also so we can get some more information about how you found the session um, itself so that we can help to, to plan future sessions as well. Um, and apart from that, I'm just going to say thank you ever so much for joining us. I hope you find it helpful. I hope you are able to contact your MPs. Um, please do share this with others in your networks as well. As Jukondi said, the more people that we can get getting involved with this, um, the more chance we have of being able to try and secure the, um, the changes that we want to see. So thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.